Welcome back DIYers. In this video, we're going to pick up on the framing where we left off in the last video. And we're going to cover stairs, a second story, your roof rafters, all the way up to the shingles on your roof. Now, if you missed the first two videos, don't worry, I'll have a link down below. You can go back and watch them. And just for a recap, that first video, we kind of talked about what you should look at before you start to build or planning to build on a new home, all the way to the foundation and what to look for there. Second video is where we started color framing and we started at the foundation with your bottom plate and went all the way up to your windows and doors on the framing process. Let's have some fun and continue on with this framing. So next, let's talk about your ceiling joist. Now, right here in this particular area, they're using what looks like a, about a two by eight, I think, uh, for their ceiling joist. And the size of that, it's going to be based on the span it has to go and the load it's carrying. And then these are tied in, but they don't have joist hangers, which surprises me a whole lot. It's tied into a big uh, laminated beam here, but I'm surprised that code's not requiring them. Or the other thing they can do is what I call these manufactured I-beams, which is basically a specific width of plywood, one and a half bys on the top and bottom of it, making an I-beam as your joist. I don't like those. Now, some people say those are better than solid lumber. I don't care, I disagree. I just don't like them. It doesn't give you a whole lot to nail to if you got it, when you gotta nail anything up there. People like them so that to drill through, to put you know plumbing and electrical and HVAC and that sort of stuff through there, it's nicer to have those than it is the two by stuff. Now out here in the garage, it looks like two by 12s, which is nice. In my garage, like I say, it is not. As you can see, the bracing they've got on here for the roof is spanned to a triple which is excellent so it doesn't bow whereas in my house they didn't do that and so i've got about an inch drop from the back wall of my garage to the center because they got these roof strong backs on them causing them to bow like you wouldn't believe on these they put the strong backs on a triple very very nice and you need to ask about that how are they going to do this you don't want to like my house now let's actually talk about your roof trusses themselves. Are they gonna be stick built or are you gonna get the pre-made trusses themselves? Personally, I would like to see the pre-made trusses. Now I don't know if they're not using them in these because they can't get them. The lag time to get them is too long. The cost is too much higher than stick building. I don't know, but I prefer the man-made trusses because it tends to give you more space to walk around in them so you can make it as an extra storage area and makes it nice to have a conditioned space but in these particular houses they're all what i call stick built meaning they build each rafter by hand with each piece of lumber and it works okay but like you say they got to have strong backs and braces everywhere make sure it doesn't sag whereas you don't necessarily have to do that pre-made trusses and the spacing between the trusses or the man-made uh, is going to vary by code, region, roof load. So if you're in an area that gets a lot of snow and that roof load's going to have to be taken into effect when they calculate and engineer the roof. So your spacing might be way closer. It might be two foot or 18 inches. Whereas down here in some of mine, heck, it's four foot. You know, so that it'll depend on that. And two, it's going to depend on what shingles you put on. Like asphalt shingles, you know, doesn't need as much roofing. Whereas you're going to put slate or tile or a stone type uh, shingling on your house, you got to have a very strong roof section to do that. Next, let's talk about your overhang. Why is this even important? Well, it makes a big difference. This one's not bad. It's probably about a 16 inch overhang. The best would be a two foot overhang and I'll get to why that is in a minute. But some of these houses go anywhere from six inches that I've seen to like this here is about 16 inches. And these particular houses have vented soffits because they're not gonna have sealed up attics. But why does it make a big difference? Well, here's a window. So with a little bitty narrow overhang, when it rains or snows or the sun's out like it is now, with a short little overhang, more of this window is exposed. So the water can hit higher, the sun can hit higher, the snow, all that can hit higher on the window. Whereas with a bigger overhang, say a two foot overhang, when the sun's coming down over to this area, you're gonna have a lot less sun coming in this window till it gets late in the afternoon, early evening, which again is gonna help keep your house cooler. And two, make it more comfortable being in your house without having this big old bright sun coming through the window. Maybe it's a cool day and you want your window open while it rains. Well, with a large overhang, that's gonna keep the rain from coming in your window a lot better than a short overhang. And so you can have your window open. 
open. Like at my house, I have, I think about a foot overhang and I can't have the windows open because it rains in them all the time. So if your overhang's only to here, you can see the rain's gonna come and hit up in here, run down and get into your house. Whereas out here, the rain's gonna be blocked and not gonna come in to clear down here. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about a narrow overhang. But they've got a narrow overhang and it's not vented. And I can tell you why it's not vented and that is because they're gonna do spray foam. And we'll talk about that. But this is what I mean with a narrow overhang like that. As the sun's behind the camera here, you see how high up the wall this is hitting? A wider overhang, it'd be hitting more down here. So that's why I don't like that. And while we're talking about your trusses and your roof and all that, next thing you wanna know about is what the decking's gonna be. This particular house I'll show you, they're using OSB. And there's really kind of three things you can use for your decking on your roof. One would be just plain OSB. The other would be with what I have is what they call radiant barrier OSB. The third would be using that zip system sheathing. If you're not familiar with the zip system, they have it for the outsides of the house and they have it for the roof decking. The roof decking is the brown and the outside of the house is the green. And those colors are a protective coating that's put over the wood. It gives you a vapor barrier and and a water barrier and it's resistant to UV rays for many months while you're constructing the house. You can put it up and if you don't roof the house for six months the UV rays aren't going to deteriorate it. I want to say it's got like 18 months something crazy that it's resistant to the UV rays. Why would the zip system be a better the best I would say is because of the air barrier and moisture barrier it gives but yes you've got seams where they all join but they've got it to where you can liquid flash those or tape those seams. Basically your whole roof is waterproof. If you put that zip system on your roof tape the seams and liquid flash the nails that have been used to fasten it down you don't have to worry about that roof leaking. Only where it's going to leak is if they've already cut open for vent pipes to come through the roof or for ridge vents. But otherwise, you wouldn't even need to shingle it for months because it's waterproof. But as far as OSB versus the radiant barrier, which is better, honestly, I don't know. The radiant barrier is going to cost you a little more because that radiant barrier is supposed to help reflect the heat. But I'm going to tell you what, at 150 in the attic, it's just hot. Does that radiant barrier make it 150 versus 160? I don't know, but 10 degrees it's just hot and the other thing about the roof would be the pitch now many things are going to determine the pitch your climate is going to maybe determine the pitch because if you're in your area with a lot of snow they may have a steeper pitch so that that snow doesn't stay on there and it comes off uh, two it may just be the area you're in they like steep pitch roofs or it could be the way the house was drawn up i don't really know there's different things that are going to affect that this one isn't bad it's a little steep but i kind of like mine which is about a 512 and what's the problem with the steep roof well the biggest thing is is replacement so if you've got a really steep roof it's going to cost you more because the people replacing it are going to have to have safety equipment to do it whereas if you've got like a 512 they can walk around that all day not have to have any safety equipment if they don't want to and get it done but as you get steeper and steeper roofs now they got to have safety equipment harnesses ropes and all that stuff costs. That's where that's gonna come into play. What I'd really like to know, and if anybody knows this answer, please let me know, is steeper roof or a shallower pitch roof better or worse when it comes to areas of tornadoes and like where I'm at, hurricanes. So does a steep roof fare better in hurricanes or is a shallow pitch? That's kind of what I would like to know. I don't know. But if you do know, put it in the comments. And the other thing about your roof, the shingles. Now, if you don't know, there's many types of shingles that come with different warranties. I think they go all the way down to 15 year and they can go up to 50. I believe 50 is the highest when you're talking about asphalt. If you're talking about steel roof, that's totally different. Steel roof is big bucks. So that's probably gonna be more of your custom home, maybe semi-custom if you wanna go that route. If they tell you it's a 15 year warranty on your asphalt shingles, just note that that's a cheap shingle that's on your house. And it may say 15 years, but expect it to be worn out in 10. The other thing is, is it a three tab or an architectural type shingle? And what the difference is, is in the name. Three tabs mean it's just three tabs. It's a cheaper shingle, uh, it's easier to put down, whereas your architectural shingles tend to be a little bit better shingle, a little heavier, and last a little longer. Now, while we're talking about roofs and shingles, the other thing you're gonna wanna know is the nail pattern. Hurricane areas, you're gonna need a six nail pattern. Other areas, you only need three. You know, tornado areas, 
five, six. I can tell you around here, it's typically a five nail pattern. What do I mean by is they use five nails to nail down each shingle. So they've got a nail pattern where it's three, four, five, and six. Three would obviously be your cheapest, fastest, at least way you want to do it. Depending on where you live is going to depend on what you want. But where I'm at here, because we did have Hurricane Harvey kind of come through here a little bit, I'm going to go up to a six nail pattern. The other thing to ask about, and they don't do it so much down here. Now, I do believe this builder does because I saw one of the houses after it had been roofed and they had some left over, so I'm guessing they used it, and that is ice and water shield. Now, in your mid to upper zones, you're probably going to be code to use ice and water shield. What is ice and water shield? It's kind of a tar acid asphalt membrane, sticky membrane. It's about three foot wide that they put at the bottom all the way around the roof on your house. And what that's to prevent is ice damming. And what ice damming is, is in the winter when it snows, warms up, it melts, and at night when it freezes, that ice, and it works up under the shingles, and you can actually have it dripping inside the walls in your house if you're not careful. And so that ice and water shield is an actual barrier against that. Think code on that is, is it has to be two foot within the interior. Not up two foot on your roof, but two foot within the house itself. So that means you gotta go two, two rows to get two foot inside the house. That's what you have to do. And that again will be determined by the pitch on your roof. Now they don't really, like I say, it's not common practice to do it down here, I don't think. I can tell you in my subdivision, I've seen a lot of roofs replaced and they're not doing it. Personally, when I'm gonna do my roof, I'm putting it on. The other thing you want to ask about is valleys. Valleys are where two roofs come together and make an inside corner, if you will. Is it going to be a metal valley? They actually have galvanized sheet metal valleys they put in there and the shingles go over it. Or is it going to just be tar papered and the shingles are going to be interlaced in your valley? Does it make a big difference? Aesthetic wise, yes. Maybe you like to see that metal valley on your roof. Others, maybe you don't. You just want to see a shingled roof. I'm not 100% sure, but I think the metal valleys are a little harder to do and you wind up getting more leaks with them if they're not done right. And another thing you might see, now this roof here got done before I could get over here. I was hoping they hadn't finished it. Sheeting on top of your sheathing. Now everybody has heard of tar paper, I'm sure. It's that black impregnated paper that they roll out on roofs. Well, they've kind of gone to a synthetic kind of tar paper, if you will, now. It's supposedly a little better. It's got more uh, wear resistance to it. I think it's better as far as water protection. It's not as slick. It's easier to walk on and it comes in wider rolls. And so I, everybody's tending to go to that. Is it better than tar paper? I don't know, but I do like it better than tar paper. It's not messy and a, a pain to put on like tar paper. It's not going to get blistering hot in the sun like tar paper is going to. So I do like the synthetic paper. I mean, that's just kind of a, hey, what are you using kind of a thing? You know, maybe it's not an upgrade, maybe you don't care. Now this is a different builder's house that I'm in here. And you see they have Tyvek on the outside that they wrap to the inside of the window. And they're using this as kind of a continuous air barrier kind of a thing. They've got the flashing down on the sill here. This is a little better way of doing it. And I'm sure they're gonna come back behind and spray foam around here because this builder here spray foams the walls. Now let's talk about the exterior house, how they're gonna cover that. Like I say, I'm in a different builder and a different subdivision here, and they're doing what I love, and that is they're putting OSB on the whole exterior of this house. Why do you want that? One, it's way better than that cardboard crap they're putting on. It's gonna give more structural integrity to your house having this on, and there's less holes to fill when you go to air seal this thing up. What they've done here is they put this OSB on and then they put the Tyvek around it. Those two alone are not gonna make your house air or water tight. And doing that cardboard crap that I say that they do at the other houses I was at first definitely isn't. And they miss nails all the time on that and there you got a hole, it's just a mess. It's gonna be way easier to seal this with spray foam than those other houses are. So as far as like on my house, it's actual tar paper. On the back side of the house, I've got OSB. On the sides of the house, it's tar paper. I've got tar paper for my water and air barrier. How cheap is that? I like that they got OSB on here. And even though they had the Tyvek around it, I'm not so worried because I know they're spray foam in this house. Now, what other choice would you have would be that 
zip system sheathing that they have because you can put that on, nail it on. It actually has nail patterns on it so you know where to nail and hit your studs as long as your studs are straight. The seams where they connect, they make a tape that you can seal it up and they make a liquid seal that you can put over your nails and you've got an airtight barrier in just that zip system sheathing by itself if you do those extra steps. Whereas in this, even with the Tyvek on here, you don't. In fact, you see right there where the two boards didn't meet together because they didn't cut them straight. That white thing in between there, that's the Tyvek. Now this particular builder here used that seal sealer foam underneath his bottom plate uh, before he placed it. So that's great. But let's talk about, we talked about how to seal up the bottom plate. Let's talk about how to seal, like in this case, this OSB to the foundation because even though they're gonna spray foam the inside, there could be a minor hole that's missed and bugs and air can get through. And my biggest concern is obviously bugs. What you could do, now this house here is gonna get all brick or stone because that's why they have this ledge out here and why they have this plastic and everything. But what you could do is with that zip system, they make liquid flashing. There's another company that also makes this, not just zip, but you could actually take and apply that liquid flashing over this OSB down onto the concrete and seal this up completely and make it airtight, air and water tight. You could do it with, they have zip tape you could do it with. You could do that, it's really sticky. It'd stick to this concrete. This one would be easy to do where they do that paper. Not as easy, but that one you'd have to use the tape. Now let's talk about how they seal up external penetrations like this hose bib here. The reason this sticks out so far is because again, they're gonna have a brick or stone outer facade and so it's gotta be sticking out past that. But they insulated the pipe, that's nice, not necessarily necessary down here in this hot weather but it's nice but what i want you to see is how they flashed around this there's another external penetration down there and they did the same thing and that is they got this boot here is what i'm gonna call it that goes over it part here is kind of rubbery and so when it slides over it makes a fairly tight fit around this pipe and these openings come in different sizes and shapes and then they can put this flashing tape around it again they leave it open in case water gets behind here it can get it out but now this is sealed up and if it's really done well, it's air and water tight. You could put liquid seal on this blue boot, put it on, put the tape on it, have a nice airtight penetration going on here. And it makes that zip, um, that zip tape they make it and a stretchy tape. You could put that around here also to get a nice airtight fit. Now let's talk about if you're gonna have a second story and have stairs. And what do we wanna talk about is storage. Like where I'm at, don't have a basement. So you got no basement to put stuff and you may not have very much attic space. So every bit of storage you can find is well worth it. And two, you're paying for the real estate. You might as well get some use out of it. Closet space, storage space, under stairs. Now this particular house has this fireplace in the corner why you'd want a fireplace down here in hot Texas, I don't know, but some people do. I don't know if it's because this fireplace is here, but all of this is closed off under here. There's no way to have any kind of access closet space under here because they didn't put it in. They could have had an access door through here, not necessarily there, but they could have access door here, could have had one through here, just rearrange the plumbing so it would fit. You know, maybe have a door here for access, you know, something so you can get some use out of this space. So whoever moves in later on, they find out, oh, we need more room. They'll have to tear some stuff up to put this in. And they're gonna have to be careful because one wall's got plumbing, the other's got electrical. That means they're gonna have to move stuff. Whereas if you plan ahead, you don't have to worry about that. Now let's talk about the upper floor. Your flooring on your second story. Everybody hates that squeaky floor. Nobody likes it. And when it gets so bad, you're dying for somebody to fix it. Well, fix it now and not have it later. So they've got, a uh, true floor on here. It's an OSB type product. No matter what they use, what you want to ask is how they're going to keep it from squeaking. And if all they say is, oh, we're just going to nail it really well, ask for an upgrade. It may cost you a little more, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. Because once you get everything in here and you got a squeaky floor, you got to tear up all your flooring to fix it. It's a huge expense. Spend less now and more later. And so what can they do? Yes, they can just nail it a bunch, but what they could do is put a sealant on the joist, put the decking on and then nail it down. But what would be best is if they screwed it. Glued and screwed is what I would say. Put that sealant down on the joist, put your board on there. That's gonna guarantee your least likely chance of having a squeaky floor. 
I mean, right now as I walk on it and stand on it and move, it doesn't squeak, which I'd hope it didn't, but I would assume if it did, maybe somebody come along with a nail gun and nail it down a little better. So if you're planning on buying a brand new home or you're building a brand new home, in the middle of building a brand new home, I hope you found this video very helpful, eye-opening and enlightening, and it made you think about a few things and thought, hmm, maybe I should have that in my house. After all, you're buying a brand new home not to move into problems. You're buying a brand new home to move in to not have problems for many years to come. And if you bought a new home or you're in the process of building a new home or you just moved into a new built home, let me know down in the comments if you had any issues with once you moved in. You know, have you been in there past the warranty and everything started to fall apart? Or if you had warranty issues and they ignored you and didn't want to fix them? I mean, that does happen, but let me know. And if you want to see some of the mistakes I found in these new builds, there's a playlist right here. You can go watch that video where I took a tour of some homes and showed you the bads and some goods. And so until next time, happy DIY.